Good morning from California. My name is Will Chu. I'm the co-director of StorageX Initiative here at Stanford, also a professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Welcome everyone to today's uh, StorageX Symposium. A couple months ago, uh, we had the pleasure of hosting J.P. Straubel, Selena Mikwajak, and Heiko Ertel to talk about the technical aspect of creating the supply chain for energy storage, specifically lithium ion batteries. We learned quite a bit on what it would take to develop the manufacturing expertise and to scale up to meet the terawatt hour requirement in the coming decades. Today, we continue that theme from a slightly different perspective. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have Simon Morris from Mineral a benchmark mineral intelligence, and Adam Panayi from Row Motion to give the perspective from an analysis of the entire supply chain. Simon and Adam are truly industry insiders who have been monitoring and participating uh, in the industry and providing input to policymakers, companies, and other institutions on how to navigate this rapidly changing industry. So today we're so pleased to hear from them and they will cover everything from mining to sell to markets. So I encourage everyone to participate vigorously and ask them questions. I'm sure we'll have a very spirited discussion. So with that, I can't wait to get started. Simon, if I can have you start, we look forward to your talk. Nice one. Thank you very much, Will. And, uh... Storage X team and the Stanford University team for inviting uh, us at Benchmark and our friends uh, at Row Motion with Adam uh, along to this seminar. Um, really interesting. Is the, the only downside about this seminar is I can't visit again the amazing Stanford campus in Palo Alto. It's always I come away from that place inspired with ideas and energy. Um, to take back here to London, where I'm based. Um, so that's the only downside, but I hope we can have a, you know, just as a, just as energetic discussion on the, what we call the global battery arms race, um, the, the state of play for the lithium ion battery supply chain today. At Benchmark, this is what we do. Uh, we are a independent publishing company that collects data and conducts analysis and other various forms of advisory and intelligence just on the battery supply chain from the mine all the way to the battery cell. So we specialize, as I mentioned, we have many subscriptions um, and database products. That, that's the core of the business, a subscription business. It's how we make our money. We're independent, as I said. And we collect uh, lots of information on lithium, cobalt, graphite, nickel, manganese we're starting as well. And they're the five that what we call five holy grail raw materials for, for lithium ion batteries. Um, then uh, you could add copper in there, but the reason we select these five is because you have to turn those into speciality chemicals. And that's something I'll dig into later on why that's important. Then we go all the way through the supply chain. We have products on cathodes and anodes and what's happening there, battery cells. Of course, we track every single lithium ion battery plant active and under construction in the world. Um, so much data there. That's actually my favorite product, to be honest. And then the automotive space, of course, we we don't, um, Adam's team, Row Motion, do so much detail on the automotive space. So we work with them for the detail on the, on the individual cars, but we're focused on the battery cell supply. And it's really important. If you haven't got the batteries, you haven't got the cars. Uh, I know it sounds simple, but it's a, it's a fundamental point that people tend to forget. So we also, as a result, this, this, no one cared about lithium ion batteries uh, in 2014 when I set Benchmark up. I've personally been tracking the lithium ion battery industry from a publishing perspective all my career since I um, joined my, a, a publishing company in my last job in 2006. Um, the iPhone was coming out, the Nissan Leaf was coming out then, and that was about it. But that was enough for me to get me interested. Um, in this. And of course, now the last four years is a completely different world. And as a result, we are advising governments on this. Uh, I've 
uh, on behalf of Benchmark, have tes testified to your Senate uh, three times. Um, and many different countries are coming to us. And the key thing about when, when countries come to us, it's not just government departments, it's the highest level. It goes right to the top. And that's how important this supply chain and lithium ion batteries have become. Um, and hopefully my presentation and Adam's afterwards sort of outlines a bit more detail on that. So uh, this is another personal element to the story. So the first time I ever got quoted in a, in a press, a mainstream press article was the 9th of October, 2009. I remember it well. Um, and I showed my mum and she loved it as well. So uh, it was the best thing that ever happened in the household at that time. But um, 9th of October, 2009, lithium car batteries may shift the balance of industrial power. The Times, that's, that's the Times is one of our biggest newspapers here in the UK. Um, fast forward last week or 10 days ago, you're not short of battery stories now, by the way, but this was a good one. The 5th of February, 2021, the Wall Street Journal, over to the US, over to you guys. The battery is ready to power the world. Um, what we always thought would happen, well, personally, what I always thought would happen is happening now. And um, I just wanted to start with that. I thought those headlines really just tell the story. And it's taken 12 years to get there. In fairness, let's call it a decade to get there, to get serious about it, to to scale the supply chain to a certain extent. But now people believe, they don't just believe in the electric car story, they believe in the lithium ion battery um, and the lithium ion battery successes as well. So the next slide is what we call, is this outlining this global battery arms race. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's a term I created uh, in 2015. It was the first time I used it. And back then there was actually only four of these battery mega factories that were being um, uh, built. Uh, there's three Legos on there, but there are actually four. Uh, one added at the end of 2015, 57 gigawatt hours. Back then, that was massive. 57 gigawatt hours was the size, more than the size, back, no, probably the, the, the size of the battery industry at the time, doubling it, but from two or three plants. No, the point there is now, it's not just four, we have 186 battery mega factories or gigafactories in the pipeline out to 2030. And um, that now all that capacity added up is just over three terawatt hours. All lithium ion, pretty much all NCM unless you're Panasonic and um, yeah, 186. Of that, the interesting point of this is not all of those plants are gonna make it, but already 115 of those plants are active, making lithium ion batteries now, consuming cathodes and anodes, consuming all the raw materials, um, and they're obviously at various levels of capacity utilization. There's lots of things we can talk about that in the Q and A, but the battery, the global battery arms race, which started in 2015, uh, continues, it's rapid, it's relentless, and it's real. I wanted to just put some numbers or some context, post-pandemic context, or let's say since the pandemic started, because I know it's, it's still going on. So back this time last year, we were trying to work out what, what, would, the, what would the impact be? Like everybody was, it was, felt like the world was ending. It felt like you were living day by day, waiting for the next headline, um, next news headline to come on to tell you more about how bad the world was and how quickly this virus was spreading. But um, for us, it went into overdrive. As soon as we hit May, June, our own business at Benchmark, the inquiries went through the roof. Um, they haven't stopped. They've, they've just continued. And the interesting thing about inquiries into our business is everybody in the, in the supply chain uses it but so many companies from outside of the supply chain in different industries, whether it's equipment makers or whether it's um, companies that make chemicals in completely different industries, or the oil and gas guys, um, they were coming to us saying, we wanna buy your stuff, teach us more about this industry, we need to get into it. And this showed in the number of uh, battery mega factories that we added to our tracker. We track these battery mega factories every month. We do analysis and 
properly qualify the data before we publish. Um, and what happened since May was the US added three more. So the US has 10 now in the pipeline. Um, the EU added two in that, in that um, let's say the, from March to December, 2020. Um, but China added, I'd say at 38. So 38 battery mega factories. So China, the Gigafactory actually started this. Um, Elon Musk and LG Chem, Elon Musk and LG at the same time, LG building in China, but uh, Elon, uh, and sorry, Elon and JB Straubel. Um, I spoke to JB about this. It was it's a fantastic story. It should be a book or a movie really, because not only did they build a massive battery plant and make it work and make it work ahead of time, they shifted the whole industry to make lithium ion batteries at scale. And then China, um, within China domestically, of course, that's where the EV market was and still is and the fastest growing. That's where the batteries are needed with government support, a surge. So that was probably 2015 to 2017. After China, it started to slow down a bit and Europe started to pick up. Um, certainly we're backing from the European Union, a government strategy there, which has really helped um, the European Union build capacity. But 2020 last year, China made its comeback. The US, it's been sporadic. It's been very Tesla centric. It's been sporadic, but that might be starting to change. It's not just about individual battery plants. It's about the capacity. It's about the amount of production capacity you can make, uh, you need to make electric vehicles or even energy storage systems, same batteries. Uh, so as you can see, um, by the end of, actually the end of this year, we expect to have massive capacity ramp up. Production won't be there. So actually what we'll probably see is a capacity construction slowdown, maybe for this year, maybe for next year, because the industry is going from, let's say around 200 gigawatt hours to the 350 mark in a two year period, 400 mark in a two year period. So the question is how much battery capacity do you need? Um, this is something we can discuss. Linking that upstream to the raw materials is absolutely critical. But the sentiment is there uh, over, by 2030, three, over three gigawatt hours of capacity at the moment. It's always changing, but that's where we are right now um, around the world. The key things to outline here are China's portion of the pie is stable. Okay, you can argue it's gone from 75 to 60, but China's always, we've been tracking this since day one and these numbers are always you know, up and down, well, not up and down, up, 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 but at different rates. Uh, but China's always been holding at least that 65% of the pie, which means there's always investment in China in uh, this base load of lithium ion batteries. Europe, 17.6%, um, really important. You can see that Europe are effectively coming from a, a base of zero lithium ion battery production, certainly for EVs, uh, to having a significant portion of the pie. Uh, the US is, well, Tesla dependent, LG now, um, and of course, uh, SK Innovation. Um, big story yesterday between LG and SK. You might want to, if anyone's got any questions on that, we'll see, we can pick that one apart. But things are happening in the US now, which the wheels are turning, which is interesting. So European breakdown, what's happening in Europe? There's a few clicks here, so bear with me as I click through all of it. I promise it's the only one that has, maybe it isn't, maybe we've got two more slides that have got like five clicks in it. See what happens when I do these presentations, I like to click and do these big dramatic, um, like uh, name drops. It also uh, allows me to think, it allows me to kind of get my thoughts as I click through, but I think this is it. So I think we've made it on this one. Anyway, the point you're looking at here is Lots of big names in Europe, but new names. This is interesting. So you've got the big, the big three or four lithium ion battery makers, LG Chem or LG Energy Solutions now, since they spun it out. Uh, Tesla, um, of course, Tesla are building in, in Berlin. CATL. I mean, these are the common names, but new ones. Uh, SK, of course, uh, and Samsung as well. New ones, Northvolt, the European champion also building a plant with VW, 
S S fault um, actually is should be a in the tier two and should be mentioned there. For core Magna Saft and PSA is really interesting. Um, Saft is owned by Totala Oil Company. Um, French French encouraged the merger about four years ago. Oil merging with batteries. Now they're putting that company together with PSA, the Peugeot Group. So really interesting seeing um, how these different industries, uh, like let's say manufacturing champions are being brought together, all zeroed in on battery making. North America, this is the breakdown at the moment. Uh, you can see it's capacity by 2030, always changing. But the key thing is of those 10 battery plants in uh, the US, the only ones that are active at the moment are the Gigafactory in Nevada, LG Chem in Holland, Michigan, um, AESC, Envision AESC now, um, should I say it used to be Japanese, now it's Chinese owned, and SK Innovation, which are getting up and running this year. So three active, um, SK will be active by the end of this year. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. And then what the one to watch for me is LG's, LG's partnership with General Motors in Ohio. That'd be really interesting seeing how that is um, comes along because that will be crucial for GM's push on electric vehicles. And of course, you might have seen the adverts. General Motors is now making a big noise uh, on um, on electric vehicles. Also, interesting note: the new logo there. If you or, uh, yeah, it's that new logo. If you turn the new logo, <laughs> saw this on Twitter. If you turn that new logo, it spells Elon. People might have seen that, but if you look on, if you tilt your head on the side. Uh, the GM logo spells Elon. So I thought that was quite uh, funny. Anyway, on we go. Yeah, so this is a really important trend. Big auto and big battery are moving ever closer. There's a picture of uh, my colleague Casper with his backpack. The point about the, the car industry and the battery industry is the car, existing car makers have to learn how to be, have to learn the lithium ion battery. Traditionally, they want to outsource it. Traditionally, want to go, well, automakers, we buy components. We're good at scaling. We're good at contracting. We're good at buying in bulk and pushing the price down. And effectively, we're an OEM, right? We're, we are original equipment manufacturers. We, can, we put things together. Um, the problem with that is this is an industry that's been created from scratch. So the one thing I've asked all OEMs, the one thing I ask the Senate and other people, um, is when was the last time the US built a heavy industry from scratch? And it's probably before most of our, if not all of our lifetimes. And that's what the US has to do here is build these supply chains as you can see um, and scale them uh, economically and environmentally uh, consciously. Those things don't usually go hand in hand, but that's the challenge. And so, as you can see here, this is the supply chain, a bit, more, a bit more detail on it. But what this shows is China's percentage of world production of these links in the chain. Um, there's a misnomer that China has all the raw materials in the world. Not the case. So this, uh, that 23%, I put together a basket of these key battery raw materials and um, to simplify it and Ask myself how much of these raw materials were actually dug out of um, sort of domestic China, produced in China domestically. It's only 23%. But what China and Chinese companies have done really well, and it's been a really forward thinking strategy over the last decade, is build massive capacity in the midstream. So you're taking, say, uh, lithium out of the ground in a rock or in a brine, but you have to. Uh, chemically, you have to chemically engineer this into a battery grade material, high spec, um, high purity, more importantly, low impurities. That's actually just as if not more important than the high, high purity thing. Um, and then you've got to do that consistently over time to then sell it to your cathode and anode guys. And so building massive capacity and know-how in the chemical stage and the cathode and anode stage gives um, supply chain dominance. And as you can see, China has 80%, only 23% of those raw materials are dug from the ground, but 80% of the chemicals 
for batteries are producer. 66% of the cathodes and anodes. On the anode side, it's near 100%. That's how crazy it is. Uh, as a result, batteries are there and the end market is there in China. So the world has to really, the US especially, and the EU have to do what China has done, have copy um, the, the strategy of um, the Chinese nation and um, do the same thing. Controlling the midstream, it's so important. It's not just about controlling the resources because you've got to, the, the, the raw materials will always go where the, the next stage in the link in the supply chain is based. So as a result, you can see what's happening with Tesla um, in Texas. They're creating this battery hub, and this actually is a blueprint for the US, is the creation of these um, hubs. So, so what you got here is the, uh, that's my Gigafactory 4, is it, in, in Texas, or the Terra Factory, let's call it. Um, well, it was interesting because Tesla was seen as a car company, now they're seen as like an energy company or a uh, maybe even a battery company starting to see that, but actually the business keeps to grow. The strategy keeps on moving upstream. So what the Terra Factory um, campus, if you like, or hub will have is cathode making, a step before batteries, lithium hydroxide production. That went, so, sorry, that went under the uh, radar um, on battery day. Uh, but Tesla will make its own lithium hydroxide. That's the first ever car company to ever get into making uh, lithium. And that will actually come from hard rock spodumene, not the clay. The, the clay is a, a misnomer here. Um, so focus on lithium hydroxide. If you want more details on that, Google benchmark Tesla lithium hydroxide. Free story, breaks it all down. And nickel as well. The point about this is that in many ways, Elon has been asking the upstream of the industry to scale with him. Much like when Elon went to Panasonic back in 2015 and uh, said, you know, like, um, please, Pan Mr. Panasonic, can you increase your capacity by four times for me? I mean, I'm a, effectively a start, I was probably 2013, you know, I'm a small car producer <laughs> for electric cars. So you can see what the um, Japanese um, reaction to that was naturally conservative. They said no. So what did what did uh, Elon and JB do? They built the Gigafactory. They they forced they like, we've got to do it ourselves and force the industry to move. Well, what are they doing now? They're building cathode, hydroxide, and precursor. So clearly the areas that they're worried about: nickel and lithium, and the resulting cathode. The cathode is an interesting one because the cathode now now Tesla have mastered battery production and going into their making their own cells, the cathode is so important. Of course, the anode is just as important, but controlling that quality, understanding how the cathode is made, and therefore controlling your inputs into that are crucial to the quality of your electric vehicle. And this is why Tesla is so far ahead of all other automakers. It isn't just about huge battery supply, it's quality throughout, it's quality at scale. And um, so if you think about where where Tesla, and I use Tesla as an example just because it is the game changer here. Um, and their approach is completely different to how any other company would have done it. They're like, build a supply, well, build cars. We have to go and make everything ourselves and scale the supply chain. Now, they used to have to go around the world to collect all these components. Now, 80% of that battery supply chain is on a single site. And that will be post 2022, three onwards. So this is actually a template that the US should go for, actually is, is by hook or by crook um, developing. It's actually, we've identified three future EV battery hubs. So this one I've called, um, what do I call it? Tesla West, I think. So you've got the big Terra factory here. You've got the Giga factory here. And actually that Fremont plant with that, those new cells will, um, Will be will be production um, at the end, or will be scaled at the end of this year. Will actually be making its own batteries, quite a lot of batteries as well, like in the order of eight to ten gigawatt hours. So so that's something to watch, because that can actually make batteries that are used in EVs or the, um, maybe sort of smaller models that Tesla want to push out. But that's kind of gone on the radar. But that's a battery mega factory, and that's going to be scaling. So one to watch. 
Hub number two, General Motors, we're calling this New Detroit. I thought that was a quite nice futuristic Blade Runner type type thing. So that's my vibe there. And um, you've got GM's plant in um, Michigan, in Holland, Michigan, uh, which actually was from 10 years ago. So when it started um, with the last round of um, incentives that was up, that was built with. But the, EV, the EV space is coming of age. And you've got here um, the, the Lordstown, Ohio uh, JV with um, LG Chem. Really important, one to watch. The third hub to watch is in the South. I'm actually calling it EV South. And there we go. Um, that's kind of a, quite a few different automotive OEMs operating there. AESC and Vision are based there because that was the original plant for the Nissan Leaf in um, Tennessee. But of course, you've got uh, SK Innovation down there. Now, SK Innovation are, have been banned for 10 years for importing lithium ion batteries because the ITC in the US um, said yesterday, Google it if you haven't seen it, that um, SK stole information from LG Chem uh, across the board to build their battery plant there in Georgia. Highly controversial. I don't think the ruling, the ruling I can't really comment on, but you can read the details, but it's that the story has the potential to blow apart the US plan to make EVs and batteries domestically. And you can't be shipping these batteries long distances. So look into the LGSK story. It's going to go on for a bit. It's going to be an almighty legal wrangling and it's going to go to the top. This will go to the president and I think he might have to get involved in one way, shape or form, but it's one to watch. So um, on the last few slides here, I've got about, how long have I got left? Probably about three or four minutes. Uh, I wanted to link it to the raw materials and just give you some, some basics to, to think on, but these aren't commodities, they are speciality chemical supply chains, AKA the user dictates the flow here. You, iron ore, coal, those kind of things, Dig it out the ground. Obviously, you have to meet a quality spec, but you can dig it in massive volume and it will get sold and it will get used. You don't have to worry about that side of things. With um, specialty chemicals, you actually have to create them for your customer. Your customer will have a certain flavor or spec it wants, and you have to work with them in long-term contracts to get the quality right. And that is why it's kind of a, a speciality chemical, but that it's coming mainstream. And this is the problem with new entrants into the market. Don't grasp this. If you grasp that it's nuanced, it's not just digging stuff out the ground, it's chemical engineering, then uh, you're onto a good thing. You're on the right path. This is what it looks like though when it starts. Graphite, that's actually micronized, um, uncoated spherical graphite in China that ends up in, as in your anodes, uh, cobalt, Mining happens in areas like this, cold. Um, this is uh, this is feedstock, lithium hard rock feedstock in China. And the final picture, this is cobalt in the DRC and 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 big tanks of like, um, well, actually it's probably washing, but you have tanks of acid purification and things like this. So it's, you know, it's mining, classic mining, but these mines have to work with the chemical companies to create a proper high spec product. So interesting to watch. And then the problem we've seen is there's a, ma there's a massive disconnect between the battery, the guys planning battery plants and the guys doing raw materials. I call it the great raw material disconnect because it sounded dramatic. It works. It's true. So you can see on every single one of these is a cliff edge. What's happened the last three years is the rise of these battery mega factories or this global battery arms race has gone ahead the EV, um, the, the OEMs have planned loads of EVs. They haven't looked at the supply chain. They haven't looked upstream. Sounds crazy. It's true. They're very reactive. Build the EVs, plan the plants, battery plants. Uh, let's, you know, the market will sort the rest out. But it won't because um, the market's never been there before. Lithium is a 300,000 ton market. When I started benchmark, it was a 150,000 ton market. It's come a long way, but it's going to the millions of tons. 
So that needs complete overhaul of the way the industry thinks. It needs money. That hasn't happened. So as a result, you've got a problem. Raw material supply will be the limiting factor on EV growth. It's as simple as that. It takes seven years to build a lithium mine. It takes 18 months to build a battery plant. That's your problem. Uh, want to discuss. And then what we're telling, um, advising governments, your government in the US, uh, in Europe, in uh, many countries around the world, is that mining isn't a bad thing. There will be, where economically um, viable, uh, domestic mining of critical minerals for strategic industries like EVs has to happen. But it has to happen if the ecosystem is there in the country, i.e. you can't just mine for the sake of mining. You have to mine and chemically refine in the same area um, to build a base load of mining and speciality chemical supply for these industries. And you don't have to be a big mining country for this, but if you can do 25% of your needs domestically and then go to the big mines around the world for 75%, that's a sensible approach and a sensible uh, strategy. That's what we say um, when we get asked by politicians. Now you can see on this chart, there's four stages. Stage one is digging the stuff out the ground, it's extraction or mining. Stage two is that chemical processing stage or, or refining, you can call it. If, it, if you want to use oil terminology. Stage three is cathode and anode making. You're making specific products, different stands alone. And stage four is battery cell manufacturing. We've talked about battery manufacturing, but the only thing I want to point out here, the US is zeros across the board on this. This is for 2019, by the way, sorry. I mean, it's not on there. It's zeros across the board everywhere. The US is importing every single one of these components. Um, that's a problem. But where there's a problem, there are big opportunities um, for, for business, right? And for jobs and all of the above. So the last three things I want to leave you with uh, before uh, the, the soft and soothing voice of Adam uh, takes over is the three trends to remember. The three things that I just love about this industry, it's exciting. The three things why lithium ion batteries aren't going away, really. Number one, lithium ion batteries are getting cheaper. So we collect prices on lithium ion battery cells. Uh, and as you can see from this chart, our price last year uh, actually carried on dropping. So this is the low end of large contracts for automotive buyers of lithium ion battery cells. $125, sorry, no, it's $110 per kilowatt hour uh, selling price, not production price. So this is a, I would say this is a real number if you're an OEM buying cells, not producing them yourselves. $110 a kilowatt hour, the year before is 125 and so on and so forth. The lithium ion batteries are getting cheaper, but as you drop to 100, around $100 or below, the percentage of raw material cost of that increases. We've gone from 40 to 50% of a battery uh, uh, cost being raw materials to now 70 to 80%. So you can see um, if you don't have the a steady, stable, low-ish cost supply of raw materials, well, then your battery prices are going to go up or, they, or the, the price drop is going, to is going to plateau. And that's what those red lines on there mean. Between 2014 and 2017, back this, this battery price, cell price, dropped at 20% a year. But 17 to 20, it dropped 7% a year. What happened to make the drop bigger before? The rise of the battery mega factories, scaling. But of course, this as raw materials become a bigger proportion of the pie, it's slowed. So the challenge now isn't scaling batteries. You can still make manufacturing uh, uh, techniques, that's a really important area. What Tesla have done with the new set is really cool. But the big challenge and the big opportunities is on the upstream side, the raw material side, making cathodes cheaper. Um, that will, that's the next battleground to pushing that price down. But lithium ion batteries are getting cheaper. Also, lithium ion batteries are getting better. Point number two. Um, this chart was actually from 2018, but it just depicts 
how we have constantly underestimated since day one, the, the performance, the energy density of the lithium ion battery. And as you can see in, 20, in 1992, when it was uh, commercialized in the Sony Walkman, uh, we expected we could push it to 350 watt hours per liter. But in 2002, that broke through. And then we thought in 2002, we brought it to 550. That broke through in 2012. We're now pushing, we're now around that 800 limit. But that red line is moving up because the, the, chemi the chemistry makeup, more nickel, less cobalt, is changing. So my point is you, you can never put a, a proper ceiling on the lithium ion battery when you've got so much, so much clever, so much money and, and, and intelligence going into this market. The third one, lithium ion batteries are getting uh, cheaper, they're getting better. And the point I will leave you with is they are becoming abundant. So this is the global lithium ion battery cell capacity build out from 2010 to 2030. I've put the numbers of EVs worth their order of magnitudes, very clear where we're going here, but lithium ion batteries are becoming abundant. They're your three things. They're your three fundamentals to this. What I believe is um, the platform technology for the most important uh, mega trend, which is the energy storage revolution. And I'll pass over uh, to you guys. Now it's the end of my presentation. All right, Simon, thank you very much. And uh, actually, we're going to take some questions. Um, with apologies, uh, we are receiving a lot of questions today, so I'll only be able to ask uh, a fraction of them. So let me try to group the question in a, in a logical manner. So I thought maybe we can start from the, the business and the, the operation aspects of the supply chain. Um, so the first question is actually something I'm very interested. You, you mentioned um, the litigation between LG and SK just now. One interesting aspect about patents, especially um, those say involving with the cathodes that dictates the chemistry of the battery, many of them are expiring soon. Uh, can you comment how that has, oh, how that will impact um, the supply chain and R&D space going forward? I think about cathode chemistry and let's say, let's say research that's being commercialized. So the, the interface between, you know, research, which has been proven and, and money has been invested and it's about to go into production. Um, the thing about that kind of interface, that zone is actually the cathode chemistries are very well known. Now it's the tweaks, it's the little secret sauce, little, little additives. You put more manganese in, do, how much do you increase the nickel in? Do you add another um, speciality chemical just to, um, just to tweak this and push, the, um, and push the energy density up a little bit further? But the fundamental sort of basics of the cathodes are known. And so I, I don't think the expiration of patents will have like a, a fundamental kind of, there won't be a, a, like a, a mad rush um, from companies to put certain patents into production. Um, because when you're, when you're dealing with new chemistries, you have to, the one thing cathode companies get is, is you've got to ensure you've got a steady, stable supply of those raw materials at the right price as well. And it's, it's a balance between best fit for the chemistry and the application, and also at what price you can produce it, and if you've got those minerals and metals available. And that's kind of, the, it's a really big challenge for for the cathode guys and the battery guys, but that's where these, these people earn their money. Terrific, Simon. Um, maybe expanding a little bit more up onto the topic of logistics. So you mentioned this, uh, I think you described this as, as mad of you know, materials moving around the globe um, to make your battery pack for EVs and ultimately cars. C can you give us some insights to the extent of logistics uh, when it comes to materials mine all the way to the car. How, how massive is it? And what is the environmental footprint and the economical footprint when it comes to moving, um, you know, kilotons of this stuff around? Mm. Well, five years ago, it was, it was nuts. So, so the, you had lithium that could be mined in South America or, or Australia. It would then get flown, um, let's say, into North America or into China. Not flown, sorry, <laughs> shipped. 
um, into North America or into China. You then send a chemical there. Um, actually, looking at the spodumene of Australia, you've got it. spodumene mined in Australia as a rock. That rock gets shipped into the uh, east coast of China. That gets turned into a chemical. That gets shipped out to Japan or Korea to make into cathodes. Then that cathode material might get shipped back into China, or might, might go elsewhere, or might be made into batteries in Japan or Korea. Then those batteries are shipped all the way to the USA. That was five years ago. Now you're about 30% better than that. But you've got to be 80% better than that, right? And um, otherwise, you're, you know, the carbon footprint's through the roof, the cost is through the roof, and uh, it's just not scalable on a, on a fundamental level. But the industry is getting that, and that will actually form, um, you know, these local hubs that I talked about. And, uh, and it will actually make local domestic mining of critical raw materials more economic, and they haven't been in the past. Great. Actually, um, a related question that is um, in the North American uh, market. Um, you, you talked about the U.S. quite a bit, but not Canada. Um, where do you see Canada, um, uh, its role is in terms of the supply of raw materials? Crucial. You know, crucial. Canada understands mining. That's where everything starts. Um, Canada has a Canada could be the breadbasket for the U.S. For EV rush, um, the U.S. battery rush. Um, it's going to be a crucial partner. Um, I know that I know that the Canadian government are, are focused on this, and and now I think with President Biden, you know, going big on EVs, and um, and on the supply chain for EVs, so something to so watch out for that. Uh, the, the the Canada and the US on this supply chain will be in harmony, and I think it's a great opportunity for anyone that's developing these key raw materials in Canada to be a big part of the US EV story, which will be, along with China, the biggest market in the world. Great. Well, maybe one more question on the business side, um, recycling. Uh, this is something that um, has received tremendous attention and JB spoke here on our symposium a couple months ago on this very topic. Uh, maybe one specific question is, what is the timeline you see of recycled materials becoming an important stream of feedstock. Um, can you comment on, is this coming soon? Is this maybe, you know, five years out? What are we looking at here? Yeah, I think you're looking at between 2025 and 2030. I think what the what JB is doing is brilliant, right? I've been there to Redwood, I've seen what they're doing. Um, it's not just, it's not just uh, excellent, it's solving, uh, or it's part of the solution for, you're gonna have a mountain of spent batteries around the mid 20, 20, in about three, three, four, five years from now, as you know, these, these pure EVs, these uh, EVs that have a battery the size of a chassis of a car come to the end of their life. Um, so that's problem number one. Then, uh, so there's value in that. The second thing is, can you take those raw materials out and what can you take out and how you can you use them? The challenge at the moment for the battery recycling guys is can you, use, can you take lithium out and use it back in a battery? That hasn't been successful to date because it's a speciality chemical, high spec, it's a problem. Um, but it doesn't mean it's, it's not there to be solved, but for everyone listening, that's, that's where the money is. If you can create a technology, be the interface between uh, like the, the, the massive task that JB's um, uh, company are taking on to, to recycle volley gigafactory, a recycling plant the size of a gigafactory, if you can create this speciality chemical to, to tag onto their plants, speciality chemical process to turn that lithium into battery ready lithium, it will just bolt on, then you'll make loads of money and you probably want to speak to JB Straubel about that. But it's, it's the challenge. I think it will be solved in some way, but, but the point about recycling as well, it, I can only ever see and get long-term being about 10 or 15% of the market. Um, you know, we're scaling so much, but it, it, it's needed, right? It's a crucial part. Well, a challenge is an opportunity. That's great. Thank you, Simon. So maybe let's take a, a couple more questions on the chemistry side of things. Um, so one interesting aspect uh, in your talk is it was a focus on uh, nickel mechanism, cobalt-based cathode chemistry. C can you maybe expand upon a little bit of the other aspects of the product mix and where you see the product mix going into the future? For example, we've been seeing the reemergence of lithium iron phosphate, and how will this 
modify the supply demand dynamics, especially for raw materials going forward? Yeah, so the, the first thing I'd say about uh, the, let's say the, the market for this, a lot of people looking at cathode chemistries and the reemergence of LFP, which is interesting, I'll discuss that in a sec. They kind of see it as one or the other. You know, if LFP is emerging, that means that's winning. Or if NCM is going that way and 811, it means that's winning. It's not. The pie is just growing. It's massive. It's massive. And what we're talking about are what slices of the pie or, or, the, or the cake, uh, which is probably better, um, you know, are um, how much, how big are those slices of the cake going forward? But the pie is growing significantly. And um, the biggest trends at the moment that we see on the commercial side, I spend my time on the OEM side and battery side of the business. Of course, the push to 811, it's actually been slower than people anticipated. We expected that anyway. It's happening, but it requires bigger investment. But still, uh, that's still the main trend. NCM 52362 are the bulk of the market. Uh, LFP has emerged because LFP, call it LFP 2.0. In fact, you Google benchmark LFP, China, Tesla, there's a great free story on our website for that. Um, the thing about LFP is, especially in the Chinese market where they're more cost sensitive, it's not replacing uh, the NCA or the NCM that Tesla are using. It's, it's giving a great option for, for a car that needs to go 258 miles or whatever it is. At that low price point, it's perfect for that market. So I think LFP is a great opportunity to sit in this lower cost end of the market, but perform well. You know, we don't need an EV that goes, not everyone needs an EV that goes 300 plus miles. And I think that's really where LFP plays as well. But that's kind of the, the, the three main trends would be the ones I mentioned. And, and Simon, in terms of raw materials, and obviously there's the iron versus NMC, but also the, um, the precursor use for lithium is also different between the two. Do you think that's gonna have an interesting effect on the market? Um, say again, so the, do you mean the... In terms of lithium carbonate versus lithium hydroxide, for example, when it comes to the preference um, for the two chemistries. Okay, yeah. So with hyd not really. I mean, the thing is hydroxide is the, the favored one at the moment for high nickel chemistries. And the reality is our forecasts have hydroxide anywhere from the, the 55 to 60 or 70% or 65% portion of the market it's all growing at the same time. You're gonna need carbonate and you're gonna need hydroxide. Of course, you can make hydroxide from lithium carbonate, but if you're building a new plant, it makes sense to go for the bigger part of the market. And, the, and also the price, you, you know, the, the product you can get more, uh, a higher price for, but you know, I think you're, you're gonna need both. And um, yeah, that makes sense. Great, Simon, I mean, we only have time for one more question. So let me just uh, uh, put this one out there. Um, so again, you, you talk quite a bit about the cathodes, um, and there's a question now on graphite, um, you know, specifically synthetic versus natural. You know, obviously graphite in terms of cost uh, is a small fraction of the battery compared to the cathode, but from a performance perspective, it's extremely important. Um, for example, in your slide showing the collocation of material processing and cell making, um, uh, the anode wasn't shown there. And of course, there's a lot of discussion and beyond graphite chemistry now. So Simon, can you tell us a little bit about how the story mirrors on, on the anode side compared to the cathode? Yeah, good question. Graphite or anodes, which is graphite, goes under the radar. Uh, so important. Uh, what we've seen, I guess, from 2010 to 2017 was everyone was talking about anodes, the, the raw material side and the, uh, the R&D side was all, sorry, everyone's talking about cathodes. That was where the focus was. That was where the money was going. And, you know, rightly so, you're seeing the benefits, the fruits of that investment now with what I just said in my last question. But the next focus now are, are anodes. Um, it's the next sort of battleground to, to nudge up the, um, the energy density of a battery. You can improve energy density of batteries today by a good five, seven percent, if you tweak and improve your anode in the quality. And, and a key thing is graphite is going nowhere. It's going to be the volume anode. It's graphite is a brilliant anode from a fundamental sort of chemistry perspective. It's stable. Um, it does the job brilliantly, whether it's natural or synthetic. The reality is they're blended. 
um, for stability of product. Of course, the big interesting one is silicon. At the moment, the industry only blends silicon. If it blends silicon, it's four to six percent. Take that as an average of five, obviously, or midpoint. Um, but uh, silicon is one to watch as an additive, not as a whole replacement. The one company to watch on that, which I think are very interesting, despite me saying that, that in the past, is, um, is uh, oh, I've got the name now, it's, uh, Sila Nano, that's it, Sila Nano. Um, Kurt Kelty works there from Tesla, but they're definitely one to watch. But again, it's a bit, it's further out. They've got a lot of the big three years ahead of them. Graphite's going nowhere. You're going to have additives. And, and it, for me, it's, a, it's one of the cutting edge, it's the cutting edge research areas that is underlooked. Oh, yeah, overlooked, not underlooked, overlooked. It's been well, a long hour. <laughs> there is a message for all the materials that developer out there. So thank you, Simon, for that. So don't go anywhere. We'll, we'll have a spirited discussion uh, after Adam finishes. So Adam, if I can have you come to the stage. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Will, for inviting me to speak uh, here today and for everyone at Stanford as well. It's a real honor to be able to address you. So my name is Adam Panay. I'm the Managing Director of Row Motion. Uh, Row Motion is effectively the downstream benchmark, as some has often described it. We, we actually uh, started out the back of benchmark a few years ago. Uh, I used to be an analyst at benchmark as well. And the purpose of the company was to develop the visibility and the granularity of the analysis from the downstream component of the supply chain. So what we do is we track every EV that's sold in the market uh, for each EV we have, uh, it's, it's growing all the time. It's around 25 metrics. The pertinent ones for today's discussion are around battery pack size, battery chemistry. We look at that on both the anode and the cathode. Um, we look at range, vehicle price, charging interface, charging speed, vehicle weight, uh, an enormous amount of information we collect on every vehicle. The passenger car sector, our database is now something like 1,200 vehicles and growing all the time. Uh, it may even be slightly higher than that. It might be nearer 1,500. Um, and from that, we're able to produce a number of aggregated reports um, around uh, what chemistries have been deployed in the market in a given month. Um, we also look out into the future into uh, what chemistries are coming down the pipe in terms of development. Today, I will be speaking primarily about what's happened in 2020 in terms of the development of pack sizes overall globally, the split of chemistries, and what that tells you about the future. Because what you're starting to see is very different regional dynamics in terms of firstly sales, but also the deployment of different chemistries. Um, and so we'll start by looking at sales and then work through the chain to see how all of that is impacting along the line. And this ties in quite nicely with what Simon was talking about because the chemistries I'll be talking about are the drivers for the uh, raw materials that, that Simon alluded to in his presentation. So just a quick plug here on these slides, we show our two monthly assessments we have currently and our database uh, that we update every, every month with all the vehicle sales. And from that, you can generate uh, an inordinate amount of data around battery chemistry and so on, uh, battery cell manufacturer and anode and everything on there. We have our long-term outlooks, which are EV and battery quarterly outlook, our global EV charging outlook, and our battery energy stationary storage outlook as well. And we do some um, uh, one-off reports or focus reports as we call them, for fuel cells, micro mobility, and two and three wheelers as well. The key thing that's really driving this though is the EV and battery space, and actually primarily the passenger car and light duty vehicle piece as well. So just to say as well, we have our membership platform uh, this is our entry level product, it's online, it's actually where our reports are delivered through as well. Um, and here you have up to date uh, sales numbers, um, stories around the EV sector, our latest videos and presentations as well. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, we'll look at the sales numbers for 2020. This is for the passenger car uh, and light duty vehicle sector of the battery electric and plug in hybrid electric market. The key thing to bear in mind for this this year just passed, is that China is no longer the dominant power in terms of EV sales. Now, that's not to say it's no longer the dominant power in the EV market, that's quite a different thing because uh, from a battery demand point of view, it still remains the biggest market. I'll come to that, uh, uh, why that is shortly. Um, and it's also clearly the most important part of the market in terms of some of the pieces of the supply chain, particularly cell manufacturing and chemical processing. 
but Europe overtook China in terms of sales uh, in 2020, uh, marginally. And we don't expect necessarily that Europe is now going to go off on a, a complete ascendancy. We do expect that China and Europe will now be a relatively similar sized market into 2021 and beyond. Now, there's several key reasons why Europe took off in the way it did in 2020. And actually, to a large extent, the COVID pandemic was a large piece of that. It was a very, uh, it seems strange to put it in these terms, but it was a very positive thing for the EV market in Europe. And that's because it legitimized government intervention in the market in short-termist uh, um, ways uh, that really boosted sales. And I'll come, again, I'll come to that in a bit more detail. The third bar up is the US and Canada. And what you can see there is really there's been very little growth in that market for battery electric and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles for the last couple of years, in fact. And again, that's a function of uh, a lack of government intervention in that market uh, from a subsidy point of view, but also from some of the legislative points of view as well. And again, we will get into more detail in that. The key thing, one thing I will point out on this is that the, the key thing around that change in the regional dynamics in terms of the, the sales is that has a massive impact on battery pack size and chemistry. And again, I will come to that later. What this chart shows you here is the rate of penetration uh, for battery electric and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles versus the total vehicle market uh, in 2020 versus 20, uh, 2019. So the, the, uh, the black and white bars there are 2019 and 2020 is the increase in the case of Japan, the slight decrease uh, versus the previous year. Now, what you can see is that for virtually all of the European markets, there's a significant uptick uh, in, in penetration rates. This is a function of two things. One is obviously the increased level of sales, but also the dramatic fall in the uh, total vehicle market as a result of COVID. Um, so again, this is really 2020 was a step change year for the EV market uh, in terms of its public awareness potentially, but also its, its share of the market overall. We do expect that as 2021 develops and uh, the total vehicle market starts to recover, we'll start to see uh, um, some changes in, in terms of the penetration rates. It's gonna be interesting to see whether they can be maintained at these levels. Most of that will be determined by the rate at which the total vehicle market comes back versus uh, 20, 2020 and 2019. Um, but EV sales are forecast to continue to grow strongly uh, this year. We're expecting similar levels of growth in 2021 as we saw in 2020. And the reason for that is that the same conditions for that growth remain in place. And again, I'll get to that uh, in my next slide. Okay, so what this chart shows you is the timelines for uh, short-term interventions in the market uh, from from governments around the world in terms of what, effectively what is subsidies and incentives for EV uh, sales, um, uh, um, either on the OEM side or on the consumer side. Now working through the list, it really does tell you the story of EV sales in 2020 if you just walk, work through each of these subsidies. So start with China. In China, if you follow this market, you would know that in the second half of 2019, the government uh, had a, a dramatic cut in the overall subsidy that you could achieve for a battery electric vehicle uh, in China. And as a consequence of that, you saw a significant drop off in EV sales in, in the second half of 2019, both in China and globally because of the relative impact of China in the market in that year. For this year, the Chinese government has just given really clarity about what it will be doing in the next couple of years uh, in terms of uh, the availability of subsidies. So for this year, it's really just rolling uh, rolling on the subsidy. This year, I mean 2020. For 2021, it's cutting the subsidy slightly, uh, and that will be cut again in 2022. And that's why you didn't really see this dramatic increase in Chinese sales uh, in 2020 versus 2019. Um, because ultimately, the market there now is operating almost on the basis of economics, really. It's not so much... Uh, a, a government policy driven market in the short term. In the long term, it clearly is, and that's around air quality uh, uh, issues and also CO2. And I will come to address that in a moment. In the big European markets, France, Italy, Germany, um, you saw increases in subsidies uh, last year, uh, and some of those will run into this year. Most have been phased down uh, this year as well. But they can almost be seen in some respects as government intervention in the local automotive industry uh, to some degree as well, because 
there is this enormous transition that's now happening in the European car market uh, towards electric vehicles. And uh, the, the pandemic offered an opportunity in some respects for local governments to apply, uh, apply significant stimulus in those markets, um, despite the fact that you have rules around European Union membership that stop you uh, uh, directly subsidizing state industry, uh, domestic industries. But for last year, it allowed governments to really intervene in those markets in a big way and ease that transition that some of those European OEMs are going through towards, uh, towards uh, electrification. The reason why it matters now in Europe is because all the long-term policy levers, so if you leave aside subsidies and incentive, all the long-term policy levers are starting to kick in now for, for Europe. So this year, we have the full introduction of the 95 grams per kilometre fleet average CO2 uh, emission standard. It was phased in from last year, but this is the, real, the year where it really starts to bite. And that standard continues to get tighter in the next uh, decade, uh, up to 2030. So because of that, these, there are these significant uh, and industry changing investments going on in the European market um, that have been backed by these long term, uh, effectively sticks uh, of uh, legislation to push the market forward. In the US, right down the bottom there, really there hasn't been, because of the administration that has just left, uh, there hasn't been an enormous amount of intervention in the market, either at the um, short term policy uh, level. Uh, so there, there isn't a federal level subsidy or uh, significant level of incentive beyond the tax credit, which has really now expired for Tesla and GM, who are the two main players in this in the North American market. And at the, uh, at the legislative level for air quality and for fuel economy, there hasn't really been an enormous amount of change uh, in, 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 in the markets in the last couple of years. And in fact, the Trump administration rolled back some of the Obama administration's um, targets for fuel economy. It does now look like that the incoming uh, administration will start to uh, speed through the gears on this in terms of both the legislation piece, so introducing tougher fuel economy standards. When you talk about fuel economy standards, you're really talking about CO2 in, in effect. Um, uh, and that, that will increase the speed at which uh, domestic OEMs will look to electrify. We've been speaking to most of them in the last month, in fact, and they're fairly bullish on this market uh, um, in, in the coming years. Um, and also at the subsidy and incentive level, so the short-term short -term policy level, uh, there does look to be more enthusiasm now from this current administration uh, to, to move things forward in this market. It would stand to reason that there would, given that Tesla, who is the world leader in this market, is a, is a US company, um, and has demonstrated really to the Europeans, to a lesser extent the Chinese, how you make this uh, successful uh, at scale. Um, and it would stand to reason that the local, uh, the, the domestic government would look to support uh, a, an industry where the US potentially has uh, a world leading stance. So, but really just the point of this slide is to show to you that the, the, the government intervention in the market really has an impact on how quickly in the short term the market will develop. And you'll see that the, the long term scenario is, is pushing towards uh, um, electrification of all of the global, uh, major global uh, vehicle markets over time. What this chart shows you is the timeline, long-term timeline for uh, outright bans of diesel and gasoline engines over time. Um, and like I said, every major uh, automotive market now has a timeline for the phase out of these vehicles. What I will say here is that the, uh, the targets on this slide are targets, they're not legislation in most cases, yet. And in many cases, there's a uh, limited visibility in terms of the pathway for either local or import, uh, uh, imported vehicle OEMs to move forward towards hitting these timelines. So one of the key ones actually in the last year of the change was actually in the UK, uh, where the government talks about bringing in a, a, a bringing forward the, the ban to 2030. Um, without really any clarification about how that would be achieved uh, either with domestic OEMs or through uh, the imported vehicles that, uh, that the UK market uh, brings in. So one of the key things we look at when we're thinking about the timeline for the, uh, the, the 
uh, development of this market in terms of really ramping up uh, the, 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 uh, the, the scale of it is around legislated targets for nitrous oxide and for CO2. So the nitrous oxide standards in Europe are around uh, what's called the Euro standards. In the, in the US, they're the EPA standards uh, and also from California Resource Board as well. But they are effectively a driving force away from internal combustion engines, notably diesel engines in, in, in Europe, European market, making those vehicles more expensive to produce um, and, and less polluting from a nitrous oxide standpoint. So that's localized air pollution. And then uh, there's the CO2 standards, which are around global warming. Um, and those, those standards are really being rolled in, like I said previously, in the European Union now uh, to, to tighten up on that. So that's why you'll start to see a really big move from OEMs to make these investments. But the direction of travel that this, this chart lays out is clear. There is a, uh, a clear purpose, if not a clear roadmap, to moving towards fully electrified or zero carbon markets by, generally speaking, the 2040 mark. Our view is that that's not going to be fully possible in all cases, and all of these targets are going to have caveats built into them when they become legislation, uh, but it is a clear direction of travel there. The next slide shows you the other end of the market, which is around, you've got really got that legislative push I described. This is on the demand side of the market, really, rather than the supply side. And what it shows you is the availability of unique models for battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in a range of markets. Let's just concentrate on China, European Union and EFTA, which excludes the UK now, but that, that, those data, that data does uh, include the UK, and the US and Canada. Starting with China, you can see that it's well ahead in terms of the availability, particularly on battery electric vehicles uh, of different types of models. This really is crucial to thinking about how battery chemistry will develop over time. China can be seen as a leading indicator for particularly Europe, but, and then later the US, but the driving dynamics in the US are quite different than in Europe and China, but, it, but particularly for Europe, China is a, is a leading indicator. So there you have nearly 200 different battery electric models uh, available. They range from a $5,000, 14 kilowatt hour pure electric LFP bearing uh, um, vehicle, which sells in bucket loads now. It outsold the Tesla Model 3 after it, it was released in China last year, uh, all the way through to the very, the, the very large portion of the market, um, uh, your Teslas and BYD Han and so on, up 60, 70, 80 kilowatt hour battery packs there. We're convinced that uh, 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 an approximation of that trend will occur in Europe over the next five to 10 years uh, as the market matures. What you have to think about it uh, um, in terms of now is that the market is still very young. And in order to, to be able to develop this market in a commercially sensitive way, uh, it, where you can build up economies of scale, you have to focus on certain key models as we move forward. But as the, as the scale absolutely grows, the availability of scale at more niche parts of the market will increase, which allows you to commercially, uh, gives you commercial viability on developing multiple uh, different uh, products to hit different consumer uh, standards in, uh, or consumer desires uh, in terms of where the market will go. So the point is really here that in China, it's already started to happen. You're getting a diversification of the types of models on the road. That means a diversification of the types of battery chemistries uh, that are being deployed. And I'll, and I'll go into that in detail in a moment. Uh, in Europe, that hasn't started yet, but we know it's going to happen. Uh, because we've been told and uh, the European market is also ripe for it in terms of how the market is split currently for the internal combustion engine vehicle market between the smaller end of the market and the larger end of the market. Both pieces are important in the internal combustion engine vehicle market. It stands to reason they will be important in the uh, electric vehicle market as it develops. In the US, really, that's it, and, and Canada as well, for that matter, it's a bit of a different picture. Um, the miles driven are much higher than you, than you get in, in, in Europe and, uh, and, uh, and in China. Also, consumer taste and preferences are completely skewed towards the larger end of the market compared to uh, the European and, and Chinese cousins. So uh, that is less likely to get as diverse in terms of either chemistry or in terms of uh, uh, the types of vehicles on, on the road. So that's just one way to think about how 
uh, the, the battery chemistry piece will develop over time. The key thing for us is that the market will develop in terms of applications driven chemistry. That's the way we see it happening. And that's already started to happen now. So one thing before we move into the chemistry piece is really what the impact of those different sales dynamics those regional sales dynamics has had on, um, on, on battery pack sizes uh, over time. So let's start with, uh, at the left and move over to the right in due course. What the chart shows you here is on the blocks, on, on, on the bars, is the split of battery electric to plug-in hybrid electric vehicles sold in a given regional market last year. And the red bar corresponds with the right axis and, and shows the average pack size in the passenger car and light duty vehicle market last year in that regional market. So starting with the US and Canada, you see that it's roughly 80-20 split in terms of battery electric to plug-in hybrid electric vehicles sold in that market. As a result of that, the average pack size is relatively high, it's around 55 kilowatt hours in that given market. Now the European market, like I said, has had that significant increase uh, in, in, in sales in 2020, and we expect that to continue to 2021. But the thing to remember, the key thing to remember is half of that market is plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So what does that do? It drags down the average pack size overall because your average battery electric um, battery is about five times the size of a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle uh, battery. And also the chemistries deployed in those batteries are quite different as well. And I'll come to that in a bit of detail shortly. And then China on the right hand side, again, it's a similar sort of split in terms of the profile of vehicles being sold uh, in terms of battery electric versus plug-in hybrid electric versus the US and Canada. But what you see there is the, ba the battery pack size is a bit lower uh, than in, well, a significant amount lower than in the uh, US market, the US and Canada market. And that's because of that diversity of vehicles on the, on the road now, um, really weighing down some of the larger pack sizes or smaller pack sizes as we move forward. So these are all sales weighted averages. And again, that diversity has a significant effect on the, on the chemistry that's being deployed now and into the future as well. Okay, so what this slide does is sort of draw a lot of that discussion together. So what we have here is the uh, percentage share of the um, total vehicle, oh, excuse me, the battery electric and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle market by battery chemistry. Here we're actually lumping in all the vehicle classes. So really that means just including bat, uh, buses and coaches and the small number of medium and uh, heavy duty commercial vehicles that are sold currently uh, for battery electric and plug-in hybrid electric. Let's just start with, with 2020. This is the most important piece and it's also illustrative of a lot of the points that I've been making. So at the bottom of that bar, you have NCM 811. That deployment there is virtually all in China. Uh, the Chinese OEMs have been much more ready to move forward with that high nickel uh, cathode technology um, in, in, in their current model releases than the Europeans or, or the uh, North Americans have been. So there's a number of reasons for that. Some of these around uh, the, the importance of warranty time periods, the attitude towards risk, or well, some of it is just about access to uh, cathode materials and, 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 the, and the connections that Chinese OEMs have because of the domestic battery uh, um, manufacturing space that you have there. Uh, but it's, it's very important to remember that that piece is, is almost entirely concentrated on China with a few exceptions. The next block up is NCM 62 slash 712. We've actually now in our monthly report broken out 712 because it's become a significant uh, portion of the market in the last couple of months. But um, you can think about this as mid nickel uh, or uh, um, six or seven series nickel if you, if you want to think about it that way. The reason why that piece has expanded so much in, uh, in 2020 is basically because of the increase in, in, in vehicle sales in Europe. Well. So if you're releasing a battery electric vehicle in, in Europe with, well, they're all fairly, fairly significant uh, pack sizes, new model lines being released 2019 into 2020 were virtually all 622712 in that. So the ID3, the, the Volkswagen, you know, the leading Volkswagen uh, BV sale uh, is, is a 712 cathode. Um, and th th again, that's really driven forward th that, that piece of the market. We'll talk about what the future holds for that in the, in the next slide, but I will, I will come to that. The next piece is 523. 
5T3 is very, uh, very readily deployed in plug-in hybrid electric vehicles because uh, that extra piece of cobalt in there supports a, a quite an aggressive charge and discharge uh, cycle um, as the uh, as plug-in hybrids tend to be discharged 100% and charged 100%. Uh, that affects the life cycle of the battery if you don't uh, include a relatively uh, uh, high proportion of both cobalt and manganese there. And so that the reason why the 5 3 is hanging on there is because of plug-in hybrid electric vehicle sales in Europe in 2020. 111 piece is really felt phasing out. Um, a lot of that is legacy vehicles. So when a vehicle comes onto the market, it will tend to maintain the same chemistry it has all the way through its life cycle until it leaves the market as it comes back as a new iteration or just disappears altogether. So those MCM 111 portions there are uh, vehicles that really came into the market 2017, 2018. Uh, and the NCA piece is virtually all Tesla uh, and virtually all North America as well. And then the LFP piece at the top there uh, is a, a, the lion's share of that is buses in China. Now, people talk about LFP coming back and it is, it will be coming back for passenger car and light duty vehicles. That process really just begun. And what we're in now is a transitionary period between the phase out of older legacy LFP vehicles in mainly in China, really, but also uh, to some extent in Europe and North America, but uh, old LFP legacy vehicles phasing out of the market, they tend to have larger pack sizes than some of the new LFP vehicles coming into the market. And so we're in this transitionary period where people expect that LFP share to be larger in 2020, but it's really coming next year and the year after that, that that, that share will start to increase significantly as the level of, well, firstly, the number of vehicles bearing that technology, primarily in China, increase and then also the sales of those vehicles start to pick up as we move forward. There's an important point here and it's often missed and it's something that we're always uh, pains to point out which is that the transition of these chemistries as it's deployed in the market has a natural lag because of the way that vehicles are released. So uh, as I said a, a vehicle will tend to maintain its same chemistry throughout its life until it's reissued as effectively a new iteration of the model. Um, and also in a, in a given year, if a, if a model is released in 2019 or 2020, um, it will be released, say, let's say halfway through the year, and then the sales take a while to pick up as they move forward. So the market share takes a while to develop. It's, something, it's a nuance that's often ignored or, or missed, uh, and it's something that we pay a lot of attention to as the, as the market develops. So effectively my final slide uh, in terms of this, and, uh, and I'm you know, looking forward to receiving your questions, and, and having the discussion at the end with Simon and, and Will. Uh, it's really around this timeline and what it means. So again, an, a, 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 a conversation that you tend to have fairly often is around the, the development of new technologies or the perceived development of new technologies and how quickly they come into the market. So uh, uh, you have a, a lot of discussion around you know, second and third generation technologies, which can on paper offer significantly higher uh, energy density or significantly better charging speeds or significantly better life cycle uh, and so on. But the reality is that all of those chemistries have to be tested the way through uh, by OEMs. So that's a couple of years cycle of itself. Uh, they have to be proven at scale, uh, which again is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a task that is in some respects harder or, or maybe as hard as developing the technology itself. And they also have to hit the market at the right price point as well. And finally, the important thing is they have to have an application. So we do, and this is sort of echoing a point that Simon made, uh, we do believe that, that there are interesting and new technologies coming through, solid state obviously being one. The timeline for that is actually probably slightly quicker uh, than maybe it had been previously imagined, but uh, I'll come to that in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, Silicon dominant anodes, again, Sila nanotechnologies that Simon mentioned that is the, are the, one of the major companies developing that technology. LMNO and similar type technologies. So these are nickel manganese technologies. Uh, Esfalt are developing one as well. They call it NMX. Uh, these are quite interesting. So they, they hit a, a point in terms of energy densities above LFP, but below some of the high nickel NCM cathodes. Quite an interesting technology choice there. And the point is with all of these technologies as they move through, is that they have to have a market. And the market will be driven by, again, this diversification of applications that consumers are going to want in different EVs as they come through. One point on NCM811 and high nickel before 
I, I, I finish, is around the fact that, as I showed you in the previous chart, NCM811 has come into the market, but it's all been virtually China. The European OEMs and, and to some extent the North American OEMs are reluctant to move that quickly forward with it. And so have opted for these mid-nickel uh, chemistries, 712, 622. By the time they're ready to move forward with high nickel chemistries, NCM811 may have already been surpassed. Now I say may, because anything can happen, but there's coming on the back of it now, the roadmaps are all towards higher nickel, lower cobalt chemistries at that high nickel end of the market. Uh, NCM 9.5.5, for example, and other iterations around that. Uh, and it's gonna be interesting to see how that happens. From a forecasting company like ours, even getting the definitions right is quite difficult as we move forward. Um, but with that, uh, I'm happy to expand on anything in the, um, in the question and answer piece, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions to come forward. Um, so for now, I'll hand back to Will. All right, Adam, thank you very much for that. So uh, let's take a couple of questions um, before we have a, a discussion with Simon as well. So maybe let's uh, follow the order you presented. Um, you, you spent a couple of slides talking about subsidies. Mm. So where does the money come from? How, how is this being done sustainably um, by the government? That's a good question. Uh, with regards to the COVID, uh, related subsidies, which is what saw that big increase last year, is that, that it gave cover for some of that. A lot of that is through borrowing, uh, frankly. That's around rescue packages for various industries of which the automotive business is one. Um, and, and the point is that it's not sustainable at scale. It is a supporting mechanism for a market that is in its infancy. Even though we're talking about 3 million vehicles last year, which is a big step up from where we are five years ago, it's still a, it's still a relatively mature market, especially in terms of where it's going. So when the market is hitting 10 million vehicles, it's not going to be possible to support the market in the same way. And thinking back to that timeline, you see that most of them run out 2025-ish mm -hmm. uh, and, and get graded down for them anyway. So really by that time, you're hoping that OEMs would have built the scale uh, of production uh, and the supply chain in order to be able to build these vehicles at uh, a competitive cost. Uh, sell them at a competitive price without government intervention. And to some extent, that's starting to happen in China already at the lower end of the market. So it, it can be done, and uh, there's really no option but that, for that to happen. Speaking of China, Adam, uh, one listener commented that the, the Shanghai um, metropolitan government has changed, uh, is changing the subsidy policies for EVs. Um, do you see any signs on the declining of subsidies in China and also in the US, uh, having an impact um, on the growth rate of adoption? Yes, so, I mean, China's a good example because last year, well, sorry, last year, 20, 2019, uh, the Chinese government effectively halved the available subsidy at national level. Uh, and as a result of that, people knew that was going to happen. So what happened was that you had a big pre-buy effect in the first half of 2019, and then the market just dropped off significantly in the second half of 2019. So, when you, but that was quite a profound change they had. I think what perhaps that was, was a misreading of how mature the market was at that stage. Um, and um, yeah, so, I mean, it does have a significant effect. And I would say as well, if you looked at the month by month sales data in Europe last year, you'll see, and for individual nations within Europe, you'll see that COVID hit Europe sort of March, April time in terms of the sales numbers last year. And then it had a significant rebound second half of the year because the government's piled in with these extended or increased uh, um, subsidies and incentives. So it, it, at this point in the market's maturity has a huge impact. Uh, but like I said, as the market increases and grows and goes to scale, it will become less and less important and viable. On a personal note, I, I really uh, took cues from the subsidies uh, declining in the US. Uh, I bought both of my electric vehicles uh, and took advantage of the uh, $7,500 federal rebate and the $2,500. Yeah. California rebates made a huge difference. So certainly. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I could have showed you a chart actually, which I've been showing recently because it's um, around what's what could potentially happen with the Biden administration. But the, the correlation between sales and especially a, a, a pre-buy and the change in the tax credit uh, with volume, as it, it was linked to volume, was huge. I mean, it, you know, you could almost, you closed your eyes and just said, okay, where was the tax credit change? you would be able to pick it out on a chart from the sales. It was that obvious. So 
we were thinking that one of the easy policy levers that the Biden administration could pull this year is to just get rid of the volume cap on tax credits. Uh, it, from speaking to OEMs in the US and actually some government officials, it's not probably not going to be as simple as that. Uh, but it's certainly something to think about because, you know, you're not really spending anything and you're just deferring fairly minimal tax revenue streams anyway from that. But uh, it's potential at least. Adam, I really like the point you made earlier that, you know, the, the pandemic has been terrible. But the one little catalyst um, it really helped with is the transition to EV. So I think that's one of the very, very small um, uh, positive effect we're seeing. So this is, uh, thank you for sharing with that insight. Um, now, moving more into the demand side, um, share mobility, fleet, autonomy is really catching a lot of popular media attention, you know, right here in our backyard, Zooks um, announced there robo taxi vehicle um, do you see that substantially impacting the trends in terms of ev uh use in the market demands going forward and, and if so when is this going to start taking shape yeah it's interesting we had uh, Zook speak at one of our uh, seminar series uh middle of last year in fact and it's it's fascinating we're, you know we're building into our modeling assumptions in the in the western world effectively that vehicle ownership will decline per capita over time, but it could, frankly, it could get much higher, especially in, in North America. So, um, and autonomy obviously plays a part of that, shared economy plays a part of that. There are clearly limitations to that in some respects, uh, in rural areas, even to some extent in suburban areas, it's, it becomes less viable. But what it will mean actually is that, uh, that for certain types of vehicles, particularly taxis, delivery vehicles, those sorts of things, sales will go down over time for those vehicles because you'll be able to work those vehicles harder than, than they have been worked so far because the main limitation on the, on the hours those vehicles can work is human being driving them for the most part. So uh, that will have an impact. It will also change factory chemistry for those vehicles because the life cycle of those vehicles is going to be a lot shorter because they're going to be used a lot, uh, uh, a lot more, frankly, in, in, in a short period. Also, they're going to have to be charged differently because uh, there'll be in a lot of cases for those probably wireless charging at, at, at depots, also robotic charging, ABB have developed a system for that and DW have recently been promoting their system for that as well. So it, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna mean a, a change in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the chemical makeup of the batteries that go into those vehicles as well. So it's a very interesting piece. Adam, I really resonate with that point. Uh, you know, some 10, 15 years ago when I started working on batteries on the chemistry side, um, there was a mantra from the car maker, which is 3000 cycles. Uh, because at that time, plug-in hybrid um, was on the roadmap. And now that has changed completely. Um, this life cycle requirement has gone down significantly because you're going to be EVs. Um, yeah. So I, I really agree with that point that the specifications are evolving very rapidly. Maybe on that point, let me ask one last question before we go to the panel discussion. You discussed within the, the NMC space, the nickel mechanics cobalt space, the diversification, the, the, the change in the chemistry, and we just talked about this P, PHEV to BEV, how that has put pressure on the chemistry to evolve. How about within the olivines? Do you also see diversification within the lithium iron phosphate space? There's been you know, new chemistry coming out, for example, with manganese substitution. Uh, what is, the, what is the, the market and the supply demand look at there? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, well, LFP has captured a lot of people's attention and imagination in the last 18 months, probably, maybe slightly longer than that. In, in what was seen as uh, almost a, an aging technology, it's been completely, uh, had new life completely breathed back into it because of the development of cell to pack uh, technologies. Um, and I think a lot of that will be around pack design and module design and so on, which will, will, will enable transitions uh, to uh, LFP being deployed in, in different types of vehicles. On the uh, NCM side as well, given that you mentioned manganese and so on, there's, you know, there, there are physical limits to what you can do with certain uh, chemistries. But the, the point that, you know, I, I, I've been making is that uh, that's fine because different vehicles are going to need to do different things and you're going to be hitting different price points. And it really doesn't matter that one one uh, chemistry can take you 300 miles and one can only take you 150. If 
the marketplace is there for both of those. So that's, uh, yeah, but you know, certainly LFP is already having a resurgence. Like I said, it hasn't really filtered through in the deployment numbers yet because there is a delay in that. Um, but yeah, the, the, it's almost a different technology from the one that was available maybe 2013, 2014. Adam, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that we can't get to all the questions, but I'm eager to have um, the discussion with both Simon and Adam. So if I can have Simon come back as well. There you are, Simon. Thank you so much. So maybe let me begin with kind of a provocative question, but I think I know the answer. Looking back a couple of years, how good, are your, how good were your predictions? Well, a benchmark, they're about 99.5% accurate. Adam, I don't know what it was. Well, uh, yeah, or equal order of magnitude, I'd say. Well, what I would say is that um, you get exogenous shocks in the market, which are difficult to predict. But I think what, what and that's like sort of year to year, month to month, and uh, you, know, you put your hands up when you get things wrong. But what is clear is that there is a, there is a fairly open roadmap for the longer term trend, right? And I, I, I would stand by in five years time what we're saying about five years time now, if you see what I mean. I, I know it's a bit of a funny way to say it, but because if you look at what's happening at the legislative level, leave aside all those targets, those CO2 target, uh, CO2 legislation in Europe is what's driving the market there in the long term. And it's what's driving OEMs to make investments now. Um, actually, we did some analysis. They don't really need battery electric to meet the near term targets. But they're going to need it eventually, so they're making those investments now. So you can say with a degree of confidence what is going to be happening in the future because you're talking about such huge level investments uh, to make this to, to make it possible for OEMs to meet those standards. Um, yeah. So looking backwards, it's difficult on a year to year basis, but long term, I think the trends are fairly fairly established. And I think I think one common trend across sort of all publishing companies in this was underestimating sorry, overestimating the short term and underestimating the long term. I think the key thing with forecasting from our perspective, at least, I actually changed our forecasting methods to quarterly instead of annually. This is about three years ago because so much was happening uh, and so much was changing. We had to revise these every quarter as we collected data. Um, but the one, the one kind of key thing with forecasting is trying to predict when those inflection points are. When is the real change, the step ups in demand? And um, I think if you can manage that accurately, then the rest of the rest of it falls into place. And and yeah, it's kind of that. That's why the the benefit of from what we do, um, and what Adam does with row motion is you know understanding the whole supply chain because then you know where the, where the bottlenecks lie to the whole thing. If you just look at batteries on its own or EVs on its own, you won't get the full picture. And um, I think that's well, that's why. We have the businesses we do. Simon, Adam, given your track record, um, you know, if you guys have an investment fund, I will be investing in that. <laughs> 99 <laughs> that's terrific. Um, let me poke you both on solar. So in, in my career, I, have, I saw the, the rise and the maturity of the solar industry. In many ways, it's similar, but in many other ways, it's entirely different relative to batteries and, and EVs. What can you tell us in terms of the lessons learned, but also the new things we have to invent because batteries and solar cells are very different? Simon, know. would you like to go first? I don't, okay, yeah, yeah. I, well, I mean, with, it, it's a common comparison and I always try and think of a fresh answer, well, uh, kind of crystallize it in my head. But look, the bar when you're making solar panels, the barriers for entry are lower. You're dealing with more simple supply chains. Um, you're dealing with, you know, your biggest problem will probably be polysilicon supply. Whereas in with batteries, you've got to manage five fundamental supply chains that are going into one five or more probably copper but let's say five critical elements and minerals going into one um and therefore you're making a more complex product and um, so if that product it means you know people are going to try and build battery plants there is this rise of the battery mega factories but if they stick and if they sell 
they're in it in the game for a long time, especially if it's tier one production. And for me, I guess the the fact it's, it's difficult to stay in the game for a long time. And once you're there, I think that's one thing. And, but also you're coming from a lower base. So, I mean, with batteries, you're going to have oversupply. You're going to have many companies that go bust um, that misjudge it. So in many ways, it's going to have a similar story to solar, but I don't think it will be as volatile and as dramatic. Um, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with most of that. I mean, as Simon says, the, the product is so much more complex. So people quite often when they make the comparison, talk about the scaling economies and the learning, you know, the cost savings from learning and, and all of that sort of thing as we move forward. And while that's obviously true, because any industry that ramps up becomes more efficient and, and, and the cost basis uh, per unit drops, is you're just talking about so many more moving parts with the EV space. And also you're talking about a piece of technology that if it goes wrong, goes, can go wrong fatally uh, in terms of the vehicle. So that is less the case with solar. And so that, that there are obviously parallels to be drawn, but the, you know, I, I, there, are, there are steps there to keep. I, th I think one final point on uh, follow up to Adam is, you, this is high battery, lithium ion batteries for EVs are high risk, especially Western EVs. If, if one goes wrong, you've got a big problem. Um, and so that's another reason why kind of, I talk about this kind of sticking and being less volatile. Um, with solar, it's not consumer facing. It's, you know, it's in the energy and utility industry space. It's not down to the individual. If, if a solar installation goes wrong in any way, shape or form, it's not gonna be all over social media, is it? So I think that's, that's something to think about as well. So I mean, Adam, if I were to summarize what you said, I think the chemical complexity of batteries relative to solar cells. So the solar cell is basically silicon and maybe a little bit of silver for the contacts. And then batteries, you know, all of a sudden we're talking five, six, seven elements. Um, so I, as a material scientist, I, I fully agree with that assessment as the complexity that makes it much more difficult to control as well. And um, both of you also highlighted the safety issue. Am I correct to understand that the what is at stake in terms of uh, lives then is what dictates the commercial development timeline that's why it takes so long to qualify and to roll out market did i understand that correctly yeah i mean certainly from from, from my side i agree with that entirely because it's also i mean you've got the safety issue which is clearly paramount but the safety issue precedes another consideration which is tens of billions of dollars in investment going into these technologies that if you don't get it right, especially for a Western OEM, it's maybe slightly less the case for some of the Chinese OEMs, but certainly for a Western OEM, if this goes wrong now, then th th I don't know what the strategy would be, frankly. So um, they, they have got so much riding on this that caution is probably a uh, very sensible approach, frankly. Mm -hmm. And another very interesting thing I'm also observing between the solar versus battery industry is the logistical aspect. So solar cells are very heavy, right? If you look at the weight um, uh, per dollar, uh, it's quite high. But yet you now have the dominance of Chinese manufacturers in supplying those solar cells. And, and, and as we saw in both your representation, this is not the case for batteries. Um, what are the key drivers here that is uh, making the two cases so distinct in terms of how the supply chain has been built out? That's a good question. Adam, do you want to take it or? I mean, yeah, I, I really don't have much more to add on that other than the fact that uh, Simon's dropped me in it here a little bit, but <laughs> 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 um, that, you know, the, the dynamics of what the, the, the technology actually has to do. And as I said, the complexity of feeding into it is just, is, is really, clearly there are par parallels because it's an uh, industry being built pretty much yeah. from scratch. It operates in the same sector, but yeah, I mean, it's just it's just so different in terms of the end. end I think also another thing to look at is where the raw materials are coming from, right? We highlighted there's five or six, you know, critical supply chains to master for batteries, but for 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 solar, you know, or any of these, what are the feedstock? Are they easily and readily available um, materials and feedstocks? Therefore, if they are, or if they're byproducts. Um, the barrier for entry is much lower. So therefore you're not gonna have the raw material shortages that slow down the technology or the, pr the, the production side of the technology, i.e. in batteries, 
the slowing factor will absolutely be, and you'll see it this year, supply of lithium, supply of cobalt, supply of nickel. That will slow the whole thing down and make it far more real. And, and, and I think with solar, you never have those slowing factors. So I think that's something to consider as well. Well, if I can share my own hypothesis, I think it's really that solar is a standalone product. You have solar cells, you have inverters, you have installers, right? Um, the various part of the entire business chain. Um, but the installers are very separate from the, the makers of the solar cell and so are the inverters. And it's not a, a truly integrated um, ecosystem. They can be done separately, but for cars, it's completely integrated. You have you know, Detroit, Wolfsburg, Stuttgart, you know, built around cars. So I think the political driving forces is very significant here. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think that was not the case with solar. Um, so I think that was okay to, you know, from the US perspective to, to have China uh, take it over and still, you know, a majority of the cost is actually not insulation. So yeah, in terms so of operation, it's still there. There's still plenty of jobs around solar in the US. That's a really good point, Will, because that actually then brings to the, the slides I was showing with most of this bat, these tier one lithium ion batteries are all being tied up in long-term contracts or JVs with the automakers. So there aren't, it's not like there's a, out, well, outside of China maybe, but even inside with tier ones, it's not like there's a huge amount of free market lithium ion batteries. And actually the, if SK Innovation do get banned, then the US is gonna have, that's about 50% of the US's free market lithium ion batteries considering Tesla is internal, considering LG Chem's plant with GM. So then there's an issue uh, for the US on the battery supply side. So I think it's a really good point. And batteries, these things are locked up um, for the majority of time. And that's the same on the raw material side as well. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, just to finish off that point from my side on solar is that the, it's the barriers, barriers to entry things, you know, it's technical and it's also in terms of capital intensity as well. So if the solar, I can't remember what year it was, but there's almost a doubling of capacity for the build out of solar that you know that would be very very difficult to do in the battery industry because just the, the level of capital involved and also the technical complexity of the product mm -hmm. absolutely i think it's um it's a good comparison i think it's a lot less to learn but batteries are very unique i think let's talk charging so adam you briefly touch upon the importance of charging there are a number of questions from the audience as well I'm really curious on your thoughts on how vital the charging infrastructure is for EV adoption. We, we, we hear quite a bit from the popular press, but largely, you know, there's a lot of money at stake there as well. One specific question I have is, you know, the overnight charging or sort of your eight hour type level two chargers versus your fast charger level three and beyond. Um, you know, there's been a lot of noise around having fast charging network deployed, for example, in the United States and in Europe. And, you know, companies are discussing that as being their unique advantage when it comes to charging infrastructure. And Adam, I, I wonder if you see an opportunity for the government to come in here and incentivize charging infrastructure deployment in the same way they have done so for, um, EV adoption, and specifically I'm thinking, and just this is a scenario in my head, in suburban America, where we are here just right uh, uh, in, in Palo Alto, you know, if every home has a charger, a level two charger, which is about, you know, a thousand dollars or so to, to, to purchase and install, um, and you have adequate charger in the workplaces in suburban America, uh, that will take care of, I think, a, a significant amount of um, the charging need. But this is not true for urban areas. Yeah. So maybe Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the complexity of charging deployment, its geospecificity, and also how government uh, could be driving some of these policies uh, to help with the EV adoption? Yeah, I, 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 so to start this conversation, or start my answer, I'm going to give you a tale of two different markets. So one is Norway, which you would have seen in my EV penetration slide, it's got the highest EV penetration anywhere in the world. Uh, and the other one is China which is you know, biggest market by volume in terms of fleets. Uh, Norway has a ratio of EVs to public charger of about 26, and that means 25, 26 to one. Bear in mind, the European target is 10 to one. So it gives you some idea of how far that has. In China, it's six to one, roughly speaking. So you know, you've got two markets there where EVs have been successful and, and will continue to be very, very different dynamics in terms of charging. Now, Part of that is because 
uh, uh, well, a, a large part of that is because of demographics. In China, you have much higher uh, population densities in, in key urban areas. The number of people living in single family units is, or, or households is, uh, is much lower. Uh, so you don't have that private infrastructure that you described that the suburban market has. So you have to have the coverage there. And, and the Chinese government, as it always does, pulled, pulled its finger out and got that done. In Norway, like I said, it, the, the fact that you've got this, you know, the worst ratio of any developed market in the world has not affected its ability to sell EV or to people to buy EVs because the demographics there are so different. If you look at the types of vehicles being sold, they're all high end. So that tells you something about the buyer. Most of them are living in single uh, family households because of the way that Norway, the population density of Norway is much, much lower uh, as a whole than in most countries, frankly. Uh, it means that you know, the, the, the level of private charging is much higher and therefore the public infrastructure doesn't need to be as large. So all other countries fit somewhere between those two poles in terms of the, what is necessary for coverage. The, there's going to be no alternative but for governments to get involved on some level in the rollout of this because if it's, it, well, a couple of reasons. One, because it's going to have an impact on the grid longer term, but that's, that's uh, uh, not so important right now. But because you, you're going to have to be digging up public areas to put these points in. So on street level charging, it's going to have to have at least government consent. It's going to probably need government incentives because the business case for doing that now is, is, uh, is fairly limited, frankly. What you have with the charging market is that um, you have what you've seen is that the EV markets in terms of sales have raced off ahead of the charging market in terms of keeping up. And that's because the charging market needs demand before it can give supply, like most markets, frankly. Um, but then you have this added complexity, which is the fact that infrastructure projects take a long time. So uh, governments are going to have to make it very easy in terms of permitting for those, uh, those infrastructures to take place, put the right tax credits in place so that you can claim back uh, the, the losses you're going to make in the near term against long-term revenues, um, and in some cases they're going to have to just pay for it as well. So it's a bit of a long answer, but the charging piece is fascinating um, because you have this, it almost acts at a completely different uh, tangent to the OEM piece, right? And I know that now they've started to talk to each other and there are investments happening, but it's really, it's a market all of its own. And it, yeah, the, the two pieces aren't really talking to each other. One, one way that you can relate it back to battery chemistry and battery dynamics is around charging speed. And that has an, has an impact on the level of infrastructure you need as well. Because people talk in these sort of fairly loose terms around ratios of EVs to chargers, as I have been doing. Uh, but really what matters is the ratio of EVs to fast chargers publicly. That's what really matters. Because the slow charging will just take place at home or at the workplace or, or uh, at com you know, commercial facilities shops, for example, and um, uh, that, that's the ratio that really matters, and it's, it tends to be a lot higher than people think it is, like, as in, you need less than you think, at least in the short term. Yeah, uh, I, I just quickly have a, a charging story. I don't do charging, but I'm a consumer, a user of the charging network in London. I, I had a model, I bought a Model 3 two years ago when I first started coming to the UK, and I live in London, and, uh, you know, I'm a young go-getter, um, that kind of demographic. And I drive, my, I've never used in London or even in around London ever a fast charger, the, the 125s or 250s, because I just do that on road trips um, when they're longer. I, I've, my car's been constantly topped up between 50 and 320, uh, 50 and probably 280 miles anywhere in, in that zone. Because when I go into London, I go to the gym, or if I go shopping, or if I drive my car into central-ish London, there's seven or 12 kilowatt hour chargers on the street for parking. So it's free to park, you plug it in, the, the, the 10 pounds you, you were going to pay on parking is free, goes into the juice in your car, and that's how I've charged. And, and in London, it's, uh, it works perfectly, it means you can park anywhere. So I never thought that would happen. I always thought I'd be using the superchargers, but no. Simon, I have exactly the same story. So I, I have a Model 3 um, for about uh, two and a half years. I've used a supercharger once when I drove to, to Los Angeles. And I have the same story for parking too. Um, one of the, you know, the thing I don't like about the, the university is that it charges parking uh, at quite high premium. And um, one of the benefit of charging is that the charging rate, which includes parking, 
is yes. less expensive than the regular parking rate. So you're getting <laughs> essentially negative parking rate. So I have a lot of incentive to drive the EV. Of course, it's better to bike even if you can. Uh, but I think you'll hear a lot of these stories, um, uh, people sharing them. So thank you for that. It was really fun to hear that story. Um, we're coming to the last couple of minutes. I, I thought we can talk a little bit about the integration of supply chain. So Simon, you made this point very clear that you know, there's this increased driving force to co-locate different aspects of the processing for batteries and making it an incorporation to cars. Um, is there a benefit in terms of sustainability that could be realized here? And I'm also thinking, for example, the EU's recent directive on increased um, requirements for sustainability. Is this a good thing for sustainability, you think, um, in terms of co-locating everything? Uh, is there an argument to be made um, to, to promote uh, sustainability when it comes to making batteries and EVs? I think it's one of the most important aspects of sustainability. If, if you're co-locating production, um, you know, you're reducing the miles, all of these components of the supply chain are traveling, that's number one, that's massive, right? Um, number two is you're controlling more of your processes in-house, which allows you to then change those processes, tweak them, make them more um, um, sustainable. Like, for example, you're not just a single cathode maker trying to make some sustainability improvements. You're, you're a battery maker, cathode maker, lithium hydroxide maker. You can do it all in one go. Um, so there's benefits there. Um, I would say there are two most immediate ones. Oh, and then things like, I mean, the biggest thing for cathode, for example, is the energy input. It's very energy intensive to make cathode. So you've got to have a, if possible, a, a low carbon or renewable um, source for that. So once if you can co-locate these battery hubs right next to, you know, uh, uh, wind, solar or nuclear energy, um, then it's game on for the CO2 footprint. Uh, but that's just my, my ramblings. Now, Adam, you got? Yeah, I don't have an enormous amount to add to that. Other than that, the energy piece is, is vital because, you know, if you're talking about, you know, I'm fairly agnostic about it, but if you're talking about a green technology, then it does, it, the sense is that from a public perception point of view, it would be better to have the feedstocks all for that accountable and, uh, and, and as green as possible. Uh, that also goes for the ESG piece as well. So, you know, uh, where he's coming from. So, yeah, I mean, that, that is something that's slightly overlooked, but increasingly, particularly in Europe, you're starting to see that hydropower and uh, battery cell manufacturing. Yeah, and I think, I think the, the, the fundamental principle is if instead of having seven or eight companies in the supply chain, which you used to have 10 years ago, if you've got three, that's a much better gig for everything, cost, sustainability, so on and so forth. And I think that's the way we're going over the next 10 years. We're probably at about five at the moment. I think that'll go to about three. And I think you'll have a really, that's, I think that's key to scaling and key to efficiency and key to ESG as well. So I'm like, yeah. agree with more, it's, I think having many participants in the supply chain, it becomes very leaky in terms of environmental footprint, CO2 and others. I, I fully agree. Adam, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, uh, this, there's almost like a legacy issue here with the lithium ion battery industry, which is that previously it was okay to operate at a relatively small scale. And you see that with lithium hydroxide converters, maybe in China or carbon converters in China. But you know, then you, you barely know any of those names if you read them, no, they're not household names. So um, yes, yeah, so there is that legacy issue. It makes sense that as the industry grows, scale improves, and traceability has to improve, and all that sort of thing, there will be consolidation in that case. Adam and Simon, we only have three minutes left. Um, I thought I would end with another provocative question: Is you highlighted today the synergy of all the players um, in making batteries happen and EVs happen? Can you talk critically, maybe for a minute or two each? the disconnections that have to be addressed. What are not well connected yet? Um, I can tell you one thing, you know, academia and industry isn't very well connected uh, in terms of R&D. What are the big opportunities for connections to be made? Adam, so, do you, uh, Adam, do you want to Adam, Adam, oh, Adam, Adam. I mean, I'd come back to the charging piece actually, because one thing that I, I sort of neglected to add was that people talking about the rollout of very, very fast charging, 300 kilowatt charges. None of the batteries on the market now can really take it. There's a few exceptions, but most of them can't take it the whole way through. So 
there's become this disconnect between the charging piece to the lesser extent the area piece, but certainly the battery piece. And speaking to those two different parties, it's like different languages. So uh, that, that's clearly one that needs to come together. We'll actually try and do some work on that. Adam, Adam would say charging, he loves it. And also that's what his business does <laughs> in a world-class way. So, uh, and for me, R&D, sort of uh, R&D, academia to, to industry, completely agree well. Um, I think that problem will be solved as these hubs grow. And um, for the, on the R&D side, it's really important that the chemistry, the stuff in the, the labs, the, the, the chemists work hand in hand with the manufacturing R&D. Um, cathode and anodes alongside the manufacturing, uh, because usually, I mean, most of these might fit, but if you can, if you can get both your engineers and your chemical engineers together in one room and brainstorm the thing together at full scale with the supply chains in mind, learn where these raw materials are coming from. Don't go down the route of, of, of picking a really niche speciality metal. You will, it will never get into commercial production, but the biggest disconnect by far is the capital markets, the funding, the money. Funds are risk. They don't either don't understand it or they don't like the risk with this. So there's nowhere near enough money coming into this space from uh, the public markets, from private equity, so on and so forth. That's the biggest disconnect for me. Um, and that's slowing up everything. On the, and it's on the raw material side. It's from the mine to the chemical plant. That's, that's really where, um, People, well, you probably need a specialist fund for that and a long-term thinking fund as well. Well, Simon, I sense a challenge from you to us. Um, you know, we always view one of Stanford's superpowers is to convene a very broad audience. So perhaps that will be our post-pandemic exercise is to bring every stakeholder, academia to industry, to government, to one place and really sit down and brainstorm. So I think on that very positive note, Simon and Adam, I'd like to thank you for spending two hours with us today. It was very much a learning experience. Uh, and I'm sorry to the audience that I can't get to all of your hundred questions that were asked, um, but it's truly been a delight to have both of you. Thank you very much. And um, Justin, if I can have the slide, please. So uh, one of the downside of our timing here, which is 7 a.m. Pacific, it's very difficult uh, to feature colleagues from Asia. So we're now going to uh, periodically have a slightly different time. Uh, so rather than Friday 7 a.m. Pacific, it's going to be Thursday uh, 3 p.m. Pacific. And that will allow us to include our colleagues from Japan, Korea, China, and so forth. So for our next symposium, which will be two weeks from yesterday, uh, we will feature uh, two of my colleagues from uh, academia. Uh, Professor Kisu Khan, uh, who was leading many of the battery development efforts in Korea, and then Professor Hong Li, who was doing the same in China. And they will talk about novel chemistries um, that's coming online in, in China and Korea. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Simon, Adam, thank you so much for your time. Um, we look forward uh, to seeing everyone in two weeks. Have a great day.